This is my update for Russian military operations in Ukraine for May 17th, 2022. I'm going to start by looking at the map, get a full overview of the situation. And then, as always, I'm going to go into different documents and statements uh, from the Pentagon, from Ukrainian general staff, so that we could get a clearer picture of what's going on on the ground. And I'll bring in additional information when necessary to clear some things up. So I use liveuamap.com. It is very pro-Ukrainian, pro-US, pro-NATO. So keep that in mind when looking at it. Everything in red is held by Russia. And we, we'll start in the south here, Kherson. It is a Russian-held city. And they are shaping the battlefield here for eventually moving on to Nikolaev and beyond that, Odessa. But they are not going to do that now. The primary focus is on the Donbass region in the east. And once that is secured, it'll free up resources to do things like move on Nikolaev or to take the city of Kharkov. But they're not going to do that in the middle of trying to secure the Donbass region. It's just unrealistic. If we move to the east past Russian Crimea, we will see the city of Mariupol. Between mid to late April, Russia had complete control over Mariupol. The remnants of the Ukrainian forces there, including Azov Battalion or Azov Regiment Nazis, they fled to this industrial complex called Azovstal, the Azovstal Steelworks. And they hid there underground from that point on. And just now they've started surrendering. Over 200 of them have surrendered, many more likely to, to follow. And this was always depicted by the Western media and even the Pentagon as Mariupol still being contested. But what it was in actuality was Ukrainian militants hiding underground in what was essentially a subterranean prison camp. And now they're surrendering so that they could either go to the hospital or go to a proper prison camp uh, in, in much better conditions and, and get food and water because they were running out of both there. So that's Mariupol and then the Donbas region in the east. You can see this large cauldron. And if you zoom in, you see all of these salients and smaller cauldrons and encirclements taking shape uh, around Slavyansk here, a key hub, transportation, rail, road, uh, airports. Uh, here, Lezichansk and Severodonetsk. This is a, a very built up urban area. Russian forces are already working their way into it. They would like to encircle it from the west. They're doing that by moving north from Papasnaya, also recently captured, and uh, across the river here and in this area, which is where you are hearing these stories about Russian forces having trouble crossing the river. The, to be fair, Ukraine and Russia are both doing their own river crossings. Hasn't been working out well for either side. Crossing a river in this type of warfare, artillery fire, long-range fire, is extremely difficult. You have to think, you're you're trying to cross the river where there is no bridge, so you got to build a bridge, and you're bottlenecking all of your forces into this one area. It's just the perfect target for artillery, rocket, and missile attack, and that, that is what's happening. And you hear Ukraine and its supporters boasting about this because they really have nothing else to show for on the battlefield so you're gonna you're gonna hear about this russia can replace those losses when ukraine is failing their own river crossing as part of this same area operations in the same area they cannot replace those losses as easily uh, so that is what's going on there and of course to the northeast is Kharkov, and there was this uh much talked about Ukrainian offensive, but even on this pro-Ukrainian map, you can see that Russia managed to maintain this buffer zone uh, on the Ukrainian side of the border. And right here, this is where the Ukrainians snuck in with what looked like a paper mache border marker, and they stood it up, and they took pictures with it, and then they ran out of there. It was purely political, had no tactical or strategic point at all. The Russian forces in that area are doing what's called a fixing operation. They don't have to hold their ground. As long as they're keeping Ukrainian forces in that general area and preventing them from reinforcing uh, counterattacks in the Donbas region, for example, they are succeeding. Even if they went completely on the other side of the Russian border, as long as they were maintaining a threat and keeping those Ukrainian forces in that area, it was a success. 
uh, you will see people say, well, you know, if they keep moving in this direction, they can threaten, you know, the supply lines for the operations in the, the Donbas region. This line from Izium all the way along here to the Donetsk city, it's like 300 kilometers. And along the Donbas region and the Russian border, it's even longer. And you have all of these deployment zones. All of these are hubs for moving in additional supplies, troops, machines. If somehow Ukraine was able to cut one of them, it, it would not do much to significantly stemmy the fighting in the Donbas region. So again, this is the West grasping at straws. So that's the basic overview. Uh, let's get into the Pentagon briefing. U.S. Department of Defense senior defense official holds background briefing May 16th, 2022. So this was uh, just yesterday. Senior defense official says, we are seeing some heavy fighting near the Donetsk, moving basically east to west. And we do assess that the Russian forces are making some small gains to the west of Donetsk. And they say this every briefing. The Pentagon admits every single briefing that Russia is making progress in the Donbas region. Uh, the senior defense official doing this briefing notes that, you know, the main focus of Russia is the Donbas region. Just like I said, uh, it is the primary objective. Everything else is secondary. Everyone else is just more or less holding their ground or fixing Ukrainian troops in position while the Donbas region is secured. They talked about the river crossing. Uh, they talked about uh, Ukrainian forces reaching the 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 border near Kharkov, reaching the Ukrainian-Russian border. And again, that was purely political, purely political, not even a tactical victory because those Ukrainian forces are still being fixed in that area by Russia. Now, during this briefing, someone asks questions about the M777 howitzers. And uh, the senior defense official says that 74 out of 90 that are on their way are already in the fight. And he said specifically, he said they're in the Kharkov region and the Donbas region. They, they have been there for a while now. The media is asking if they've had any difference. And uh, I mean, obviously, if every time the Pentagon does a briefing, they're talking about how Russia is making slow, uneven, but progress nonetheless, then no, they're not making any difference. It's just 100 howitzers. The, the U.S. sent 90, Canada and Australia sent some more. Altogether, it's about 100 guns. There is nothing about this M777 that is so spectacular that such a small number of them is going to make any difference uh, than what Ukraine had when they started. The, the abundance of artillery that they had when they started has, has all been reduced or is being reduced. This addition of 100 more guns is not going to make any difference any strategic difference on the battlefield. They'll be able to probably point to a few tactical gains by Ukraine, but overall, strategically, they're going to continue falling back. If Russia is making progress every time the Pentagon talks to the press, Ukraine is doing the opposite of, of progress, which is losing. And the fact that these M777s are split between the Donbas region and the Kharkov region just goes to show you uh, that Russian fixing operation, how effective it is. All of those guns, I don't know, if I was a Ukrainian general, I would want all of those guns in the Donbas region. Russia is not going to take Kharkov city anytime soon. They don't have the number of forces committed to do that. It is clearly, obviously, a fixing operation. All of those guns should be in the Donbas region, but they decided to split them up anyway so that they could achieve this political win. And uh, this isn't the only reason why Ukraine is losing, but this is definitely one of the reasons they are losing. The senior defense official also talks about how there are 106 operational battalion tactical groups. These are between 600 to 1,000 Russian troops with between 140 and 150 vehicles. And when I say vehicles, I mean main battle tanks, artillery, air defense, engineering, everything. They have all kinds of vehicles. It's a very heavily armed formation for its size. And there's 106 in operation inside of Ukraine. And uh, he breaks down the number of battalion tactical groups involved altogether. 140 were assigned to operations uh, against Ukraine. 
106 are in Ukraine, and the remaining is, I, I assume, in Russian or Belarus territory. And that is 80% of Russia's total battalion tactical groups. Now, battalion tactical group is, you know, these battalion tactical groups, that is not the summation of Russian power. That is just units that are on standby and ready to go. And of course, Russia has many, many more units of different types all across Russia. But these battalion tactical groups, they are standby military formations ready to go. And the senior defense official assesses that even after all of these months and all of these claims of, of catastrophic Russian losses, that the vast majority of the combat power prepared ahead of time for these operations against Ukraine, not all across all of Russia, but just what was prepared for Ukraine, the, the majority of that is still available to Russian military commanders and the Russian government. The senior defense official, you know, during these briefings, they always talk about the number of Russian air sorties, air missions that, you know, a Russian warplane takes off, flies a mission and comes back. That would be one sortie. They're flying 250 sorties a day per day. It could be over 300. It could be as few as 200, but it's usually between two and 300. They talked about uh, Russia targeting the Yavorev trading area around Lvov in western Ukraine. That was the, the area all of these foreign volunteers and mercenaries were staging before going onward to battle in Ukraine. Uh, Russia hit that very early on during the conflict with missiles, and they continued to do so. I, I assume that's because fighters are still showing up there. There's still might be training taking place there. Weapons might be stored there. And so it's still a target Russia is interested in. And the Western media, when during these briefings, they're very apprehensive and they're always looking for the Pentagon to give them some kind of sure sign that Russia is going to lose any day now. And this is what the senior defense official says. We do know that the Russians continue to take casualties. They continue to lose equipment and systems every day in the fighting. There's back and forth every single day. And it's not like the Russians haven't made some progress. They have. It's been, again, uneven, slow, incremental, short, and small, but they have continued to make a little bit of progress. This is the Pentagon admitting this. And again, the type of fighting taking place in the Donbas region, it is artillery fire, long-range fire, rocket fire, uh, at heavily fortified positions that the Ukrainians have built up over the course of eight years. This is going to be very slow and incremental fighting. It is not going to be lightning warfare. Now let's talk about Mariupol and the Azovstal steelworks and these Ukrainian troops uh, surrendering. They surrendered. But look at this headline from The Guardian. Hundreds of Ukrainian troops evacuated from Azovstal steelworks after 82-day assault. More than 260 soldiers, many wounded, leave Mariupol plant that be became symbol of resistance. And again, it became a symbol of resistance because that's how the Western media framed it. In reality, th these were a broken military force hiding underground in what was a self-imposed underground prison camp. And when you're reading this, they, they say... Uh, this is the, the the wounded 53 heavily wounded soldiers were evacuated to a hospital in a Russian controlled town and more than 200 others were transported through a corridor to Alenivka. But they don't really say if that's in Russian held territory or not. So luckily we have this BBC article, Mariupol, hundreds of besieged Ukrainian soldiers evacuated, uh, but really it's surrendered. They surrendered. And they admit here that uh, the heavily wounded are going to one Russian, uh, one town held by Russian-backed rebels, and the other 211 are going to the other rebel-held town. So they're they're surrendering, and they're either going to a hospital to get medical care f from Russia and its allies, or they're surrendering to Russia and its allies, and they're being detained in Russian held territory. Now this, getting back to this Guardian article, they admit that this is a significant defeat for Ukraine. Uh, that is a quote, a significant defeat for Ukraine. The Guardian also claims 
referring to who these fighters were. They were a lot of them were Azov Battalion or Azov Regiment, whatever you want to call them. Nazis. They were Nazis. They literally operated under a Nazi flag and wore Nazi insignia on their uniforms. It says the Azov Regiment, which has in the past had nationalist far right affiliations, was a militia formed to fight the Russians after the invasion of Ukraine in 2014, but has become a unit of the Ukrainian National Guard. They were they were always Nazis. They are Nazis right now. They have Nazi insignia on their uniforms. You, you know, there's this myth that they reformed and they purged their far right tendencies. But if you're going to denazify a military unit, the easiest thing would to be would be to change its flag, to to change its insignia, and they didn't do that. They kept the the wolf angle, this SS uh, unit during World War II. They had this wolf angle. They incorporated that into their uniform and their flag and they kept it all the way up till today they're nazis and this is just the west trying to whitewash that fact and just to drive the point home there's this article right here from the bbc from 2014 ukraine underplays role of far right in conflict and what this article reveals is that back then ukraine was trying to whitewash their own nazi problem and what they were trying to do back in 2014 is what the entire western media has ended up doing today just pretending that they're not nazis or that they've cleaned up their act when you know look this was the flag back in 2014 and it's still the flag today this wolf's angle and uh, they even talk about that so what does the bbc article say it says they're talking about the azov battalion run by the extremist patriot of ukraine organization which considers jews and other minorities subhuman and calls for a white christian crusade against them it sports three Nazi symbols on its insignia, a modified wolf's hook, wolf's angle, a black sun, and the title Black Corps, which was used by the Waffen-SS. Those were the worst of the German Nazis during World War II, the Waffen-SS. So undoubtedly, they were Nazis then, they are Nazis today. Uh, even the Western media has admitted it in the past. They have obvious motivations for trying to deny it now. So. This Azov Battalion, we kept hearing them referred to in, in recent weeks as the defenders of Mariupol, when, when re in reality they were just hiding underground in the steelworks and the entire city was already taken over by Russia. On May 9th, they had a Victory Day parade in Mariupol. The, they are returning utilities and beginning reconstruction. So uh, these guys were hiding underground and the whole Western media was pretending that they were somehow still defending the whole city. It was ridiculous and even the pentagon in their briefings would classify mariupol as a city still being contested it was utterly absurd and when you have to lie and point to a bunch of nazis hiding underground starving to death and depict that as the, uh, a city being contested that's because you don't have actual victories to show the public so now that they're starting to surrender how is Azov battalion or regiment, whatever you want to call it, how are they going to go down in history? First of all, the Azov battalion represented the height of Ukrainian military prowess from 2014 onward. They were supposed to be the best troops that they had. And they were supposed to be able to succeed when everyone else failed. They also represented the depths of Ukrainian ideological extremism. They were Nazis. And uh, they were setting an example that they were trying to model the rest of the military after, in, in some ways, more successful than others. Now, now they're, they're starting to surrender. Just a week or two ago, they swore they would not surrender. They said they will fight to the last man. Clearly, they didn't do that. Some people thought, you know, they're Nazis, but I still admire their bravery. And I had said, consistently that they're not brave they're fighting on they're clinging on they're hiding in the in the basements of the azovstal steelworks because in the back of their mind they thought they still had a chance of getting out of being evacuated to ukrainian held territory or, or to a third country and not having to face the consequences of 
who they are and what they have done. They are Nazis, and for the last eight years, they have terrorized the people in Mariupol. But uh, as I'm going to point out here in a moment, they're not the only group of, of Azov fighters in Ukraine. That Azov battalion garrison in Mariupol, they're gone. They're all surrendering. They're all going to end up either in a hospital in Russian-held territory or in a prison in Russian-held territory awaiting trial. Uh, I would not want to be them. And this is after weeks of them pretending that they were going to fight to the last man, man until the very end here they were begging everyone to come and save them and no one did and this is going to be a big political blow to ukraine because again this was the best that ukraine had to offer and they broke they broke and then they surrendered after swearing they wouldn't what does that say about the rest of ukraine the rest of their forces Financial Times article from relatively recent uh, March 30th, 2022. And it says, don't confuse patriotism and Nazism. Ukraine's Azov forces face scrutiny. This article says there are now scores of thousands of Azov fighters, said uh, Beletsky. He's the founder of these Azov Nazis. Uh, and they, they say in 2008, he co-founded the Social National Assembly a grouping of the most extreme nationalist Ukrainian political parties. Most are fighting within Ukraine's territorial defense units, including more than 1,000 in Kharkiv, which is Kharkov, he said. And then it says the Interior Ministry uh, did not comment on these figures. And I always said that there are many, many more Azov Nazis and other extremists fighting uh, within or alongside Ukraine's military many thousands not just a couple of hundred like the western media keeps trying to say if if and when they admit that there are nazis in and alongside ukraine's military they'll just say well it's just a small number but there's actually thousands and and here they're admitting that there's thousands and that there's at least 1000 in Kharkov and i've talked about them before how they they have been terrorizing for the last 8 years they have been terrorizing the russian speaking population there into burying any sort of pro-Russian expression. Now, this is We keep hearing about how Ukraine is, is fighting for democracy, and, but this is what has actually been going on in Ukraine for eight years. And the Western media has been trying to cover it up the best that they can. But of course, you can see, I'm not citing any Russian media here at all. It's all Western media, uh, every once in a while, admitting it. So again, around Kharkov, they had this offensive and they took some pictures with a mock border marking, and then they left the area. And it's still under the control of Russian forces. This was supposed to be a big victory. They wouldn't stop talking about this. The river crossing, surely a, a loss, a tactical loss for Russia, but not a strategic loss, not yet, as long as they can figure out how to resolve this or go around this. Uh, but again, they're going to keep talking about that because they have nothing else to show for it. By mid to late April, Russian forces had totally taken over Mariupol, and you had these Nazis hiding in the basement of Azovstal, starving to death, dying of, dying of thirst, dying from their injuries, uh, begging the outside world for help because they couldn't break out themselves. Ukrainian forces, despite being depicted as winning all over Ukraine, could not break in and, and help get them out. And yet every briefing that the Pentagon did, if someone asked about Mariupol, they would say it was contested because they don't have actual victories to show the public, to cite, to put in the place of these ridiculous uh, grasping at straws. So in the next couple of days, keep an eye on the Donbass region. And if you're checking the map every single day, check the areas around uh, Slavyansk and Lyman. Also check Lizichansk and Severodonetsk, that urban area in the, the northeast part of the encirclement as Russia makes progress there. Also Papasnaya, this is kind of in the east of the encirclement, that very large and now growing salient. Keeping Keep an eye on that. Uh, also keep an eye on this so-called Ukrainian offensive. I mean, if it was something actually significant, it would continue. If all they did was reach the border, take their picture, and then stop, which is what it actually looks like at this point. I mean, it might be too soon to say. 
I mean, it, it really looks like the only thing they secured was a, was a photo op there. And uh, as of stall, keep an eye on what else ends up being found there. There were a lot of rumors and theories about what was in the Azovstal steelworks where these Nazis and other Ukrainian fighters were hiding. I honestly think the the urgency in trying to evacuate people out of Mariupol was because it was Azov Battalion. It was the most elite military formation Ukraine had. And if they were either decimated there or they surrendered and became prisoners would have a huge blow to Ukrainian morale. And now they are surrendering. Already over 200 have surrendered and the rest inevitably will have to surrender. They're not getting out of there. So it could have been just this political impetus that they had to somehow salvage that because they were so elite to have been at such a high vaunted level in Ukrainian society, you know, post-2014 Ukrainian society, and then to be begging to be evacuated so you didn't have to surrender and because you didn't actually have the bravery to fight to your death. A far fall from grace. Whatever else is in Azovstal under, underground, we'll find out soon enough. I, I'm not even going to get into what the different theories and rumors are. So that's it for this update. I'll do another one in a couple of days unless something happens sooner. Uh, until then, if you thought this video was useful, please like and share it. Think about subscribing. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, check the video description below for other places you can find my work, like on Odyssey, on Rumble, and also on Telegram. Also in the video description below are all of these links that I referenced when putting this video together, as well as for ways you can help support my work. You could do that through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and also through PayPal. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's month to month, or one-time donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, or putting in a kind comment or sending me news tips. I greatly appreciate all of that help. I could not do this without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.